me start recording. Great. So welcome everybody and thank you, thank you for joining us in this uh, latest grand round. Today we are going to talk about uh, uh, the most typical or most common um, congenital heart defects in the adult and Dr. Ignacio Vera and Dr. Uh, Maria Sol de los Santos from Argentina are going to present their case about a uh, contra construction and in Epstein's anomaly. And Dr. David Barron uh, from mm -hmm. Sick Kids in Canada <laughs> is going to be the moderator. Uh, so, Dr. Barron, please take the word. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for the speakers for joining us today. And yeah, it's your turn to speak, your presentation. So, please take the word and go ahead. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, I, I'm David Barron. I'm a surgeon in uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. And uh, Matthew has very kindly asked me to moderate today. So welcome, everybody. Very nice to be here. And uh, this is a great idea to uh, have a wider discussion around particularly some adult congenital cases. Yeah. And so we're talking about uh, you know, Epstein's anomaly, uh, predominantly in some adolescents and adults today. And uh, uh, Maria de los Santos is going to uh, give us a presentation uh, on Epstein, and particularly talking about the cone uh, reconstruction repair. Okay, Maria, so we'll get started and then we'll have time for some discussion and questions afterwards. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Maria Sol de los Santos. I am the instructor of residence at Garrahan Hospital in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I have no disclosures. Here there is a, a list of the main topics that we are going to discuss today. In 1866, Dr. Wilhelm Epstein described this pathology for the first time. Uh, Epstein's anomaly is a malformation of the tricuspid valve and of the right ventricle. Really? The main characteristics are adhesions of the leaflets, sorry, uh, adhesions of the leaflet to the myocardium, there is a failure in the delamination, uh, an apical sliding of the functional ring, there is a dilation of the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, an anterior redundant uh, valve uh, with a cell-like form, and a dilation of the union of the atrioventricular. So uh, the tri tricuspid valve is the most apically placed valve with the largest orifice among uh, the four valves uh, of the heart. It has an annulus with oval shape and it has in, in the normal anatomy three valves, an anterior, a posterior and a septal. The anterior leaflet is the most mobile of the three and it forms a prominent intracavitary a curtain that partially divides the inflow Rizal. from the outflow. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt uh, you for a second. Also, the anterior papillary muscle is the the most. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt yes. you for a second. I'm going to mute everybody, and you can. Hello. I'm going to I'm going to mute everybody. Sorry, and then you can unmute your microphone and uh, restart talking. Sorry, because we have a lot of like noise in the background. Okay. So now please go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. OK, uh, you can hear me OK? Yes, perfectly. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. OK, so the anterior uh, valve is the most, uh, the, the bigger of the three. And also the, the anterior uh, muscle is the most developed. The posterior and the septal valves, they are smaller and uh, they have they lie against the inferior and the septal uh, wall of the right ventricle. In this pathology, there is a failure in the delamination. In this picture, you can see a, a very big spectrum that goes from the mild presentations to the very severe ones. In, in this picture, we have on the top, a normal tricuspid valve with the three leaflets at the same level. In Epstein's anomaly, uh, we have um, a displacement of the posterior and the septal valves 
to, to downwards and, and the maximal point of displacement is at the crux of the heart. In this uh, image, uh, you can see a four chambers uh, a picture where you can watch uh, a naturalized portion of the right ventricle, uh, the failure of the delamination, a small right ventricle function, functional right ventricle, the displacement of the interventricular septum to the left septum and a massive right atrium. Uh, this is a picture of a patient that we have at our institution. You can see a large anterior leaflet, the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, and practically, practically there isn't any septal valve. In this picture, it's, it's an schematic picture of Epstein disease. Uh, you can see again an anterior redundant uh, leaflet and the displacement of the posterior and the septal valve to downward with a naturalized portion of the right ventricle and with a big uh, right atrium. So in this pathology, uh, we mostly have a problem with uh, regurgitation uh, of the tricuspid valve. This uh, is associated with uh, this function of the functional and the anatomical right ventricle. Uh, all of this decrease the flow through the right ventricle and ends up in a decrease of the pulmonary blood flow uh, uh, shunt through the ASD or PFO produ producing progressive cyanosis. So all this problem uh, of regurgitation uh, generates a progressive increase of the dilation of the right atrium. This produces a deterioration of the function of the right ventricle. The patient can start to, to have uh, arrhythmias and this goes on and on because the arrhythmias increase the regurgitation. The regurgitation also increase again the dilation of the right, right atrium. And, and we have a problem that goes uh, worse every day. Uh, this pathology is also associated with Wolf-Parkinson-White disease and with AB nodal reentrant tachycardia. This is a typical X-ray in a severe presentation in a neonatal patient with a massive cardiomegaly, uh, also known as wall-to-wall -wall cardiomegaly. Uh, here we have a, a computerized tomography and an MRI where we can see a, a big dilated right atrium and small functional right ventricle, the displacement of the interventricular septum uh, and a massive right atrium. There are different ages of presentation depending on the severity of the regurgitation of the tricuspid valve and the dysfunction of the right ventricle. In the severe ones, uh, the presentation can be really early at the uh, neonatal period. And in mild cases, uh, the presentation can be at the adulthood or, or it, it can be even uh, asymptomatic. The GOES score is a predictor of mortality risk that, that Seller Major describes. This uh, describes an echocardiographic grading score with one to four gradies, and it's uh, the radio of the combined area of right atrium and atrialized uh, right ventricle uh, compared uh, to the fun functional right ventricle with the left heart. This uh, score goes from the mild uh, to the severe ones in goes one and two, uh, we have a mortality risk about eight or nine percent, and in GOES four, the mortality risk is about one hundred percent. This is a very useful um, score for neonatal patients. This is an anatomical classification, the Carpentier classification in type A. We have a volume of true vent in, in type B. We have a large component of right ventricle that is adequate, uh, but exists uh, the anterior, sorry. There is a large um, component of the right ventricle 
but uh, the anterior leaflets uh, of the tricuspid valve can move uh, freely. In type C, the anterior leaflet is severely restricted and it, it can cause uh, an obstruction of the right ventricle outflow tract. And in type D, uh, this is the worst of the, of the cases. We have almost a complete atrialization uh, of, the, of the right ventricle. It is, uh, this pathology it is associated with other cardiac defects like um, ASD or PFO, uh, with BSD with or without uh, pulmonary atresia, with obstruction of the right uh, ventricle outflow tract, PAD, PDA, and coarctation of aorta. The echocardiography is a diagnostic test of choice. With this study, we can evaluate the tricuspid valve, the size uh, and the function of the different chambers. We can see the displacement of the septal and the posterior leaflets, the dilation of the right atrium, the portion atrial atrialized of the right ventricle, and this uh, allow us to assess the site, the site and the degree of the regurgitation of valves. So now we are going to talk about the cone technique. The cone technique is a surgical procedure described by Dr. Da Silva. It is a, a surgical repair uh, modified from Car Carpentier's procedure. The objective of this surgery is to delaminate all the leaflets, detaching them from the myocardium, but maintaining uh, the apical attachments. This is very important to, to can uh, develop the cone shape of, of these techniques. And also uh, the, the goal of this technique is to uh, take the, the cone reconstruction to the true annulus level. To can perform this surgery, we need uh, extracorporeal circulation with bicaval cannulation and infusing cardioplegia uh, for myocardial protection. So we must perform an oblique um, atriotomy. This allows us to have a good exposure of the tricuspid valve. The first incision is made in, at the anterior leaflet at 12 o'clock. This incision is a few millimeters away from the true annulus. Then this incision is prolonged posteriorly, detaching the anterior and the posterior uh, tricuspid leaflets from their anomalous attachments in the right ventricle. And, and we must uh, develop a single piece of uh, the anterior and the posterior uh, leaflets. The most important thing here, uh, like I say before, is to remove all the attachments between the leaflets and the myocardium, but preserve the attachments uh, to the apical uh, right ventricle. Uh, here we can see uh, the delamination of the posterior and the septal valves. Uh, it is very important to take some time and to go uh, and remove everything to can uh, make a really good uh, detachment. After the, the delamination, uh, the posterior and the septal leaflets uh, have been completely mobilized. So uh, the cut edge of the posterior leaflet is rotated now clockwise to meet the proximal edge of the septal leaflet, forming uh, our new tricuspid valve resembling a, a cone. This, this kind of ripper has a cone shape. Uh, it is in these patients, uh, we have an hypoplastic uh, septal valve, but in some patients it has some development. So it is very important to try to detach also uh, this valve and to try to include uh, into the repair. In some cases, we need to perform some fenestrations to increase the inflow area and to allow a uh, uh, correct mobilization of the cone. 
after uh, we develop our our cone, we're going to to do the application of the of the atrialized portion of the right ventricle. Uh, this is not necessary in every patient, but it is important in, in those patients that have a really big atrialized portion of the right ventricle. Um, this uh, suture must be superficially not deep because uh, there is a risk of damage of the coronary artery. We must keep always in mind the position of the right coronary artery at the level of the true annulus. And um, this suture must end about one centimeter away from the AV node uh, place. Uh, here is a picture of a patient of us. This is how it looks like the cone before we, we do the reimplantation at the real annulus level. So the final step is to take our new valve to the level of the true annulus. Um, in this moment, we often need to, the, to perform application of the annulus because the new tricuspid valve is uh, smaller than the true annulus that it is dilated. So uh, we need to perform application and then uh, with separate uh, sutures where we are going to re-implant re the, the cone valve. Here we have a video. Uh, of a surgery at Garrahan Hospital, where you can see the reimplantation of the cone at the level of the real annulus. And this is a picture of the final result. A very important thing is to perform a transesophagical echocardiogram at the OR uh, that allowed us to, to measure the valvular competition, if there is any gradient, uh, the right and the left ventricle function. This is an echocardiogram of one of our patients that went into cone reconstruction. You can see a mean gradient of three, a good ventricular function and a proper movement of the cone reconstruction. Here we can see the cone with a minimal degree of regurgitation in the post-operative period. This is an operative period. You can see uh, how the cardiomegaly decreases. In 2007, uh, Dr. Da Silva groups uh, present their experience with uh, the con reconstruction. They, they um, indicate the surgery in patients uh, with functional class three or four, or in patients asymptomatic, uh, functional class one or two, but with cardiomegaly. Also in patients with significant cyanosis and polycythemia with paradoxical embolism, with tachycardia uh, and accessory atrioventricular bundle. Uh, they have 40 patients, only one early death, one late death because of an endocarditis, and they have two reoperation because of regurgitation. Both patients went into re repair. Uh, as the most important results, they show a reduction in the tricuspid annulus in the post-operative period and a restoration of the ventricular morphology. So the patients with congenital heart disease, with the possibility of performing fetal diagnosis, uh, all these new techniques has been improving the care of the patients. Also, uh, the development of new teams and the training of the intensive care teams have uh, also been improving uh, the quality of care. All these improvements uh, have generated an increase in the survival of the patients with congenital heart disease. So it's not an unusual thing to see every day more and more adults with congenital heart disease. In adults with Epstein's anomaly, we can see a very big spectrum of symptoms like uh, heart failure, uh, 
progressive right ventricle dysfunction, dysfunction. so um, the, the best thing to do is to try a, a repair if the valve is if the valve has the, the correct anatomy to do it. And uh, it is a good thing to do when the patient is asymptomatic um, to prevent all these symptoms uh, to go worse. The bidirectional gland or the one and a half ventricle repair has been used in patients when the right ventricle is judged as not capable of supporting the pulmonary circulation. Uh, this reduces the right ventricle preload and it might decrease also the right ventricle work. In patients with right ventricle function uh, impaired, the Glenn procedure may facilitate the treatment by un unloading the right ventricle and providing preload to the left ventricle. This might be an alternative in patients with severe presentation of Epstein's anomaly. There are different uh, types of uh, Glenn shunt, like the classic Glenn shunt, the bidirectional Glenn shunt, the bidirectional uh, Glenn shunt with right pulmonary artery banding. This in patients with previous uh, pulmonary valve incompetence or in those uh, who require transannular patch or a uh, right ventricle pulmonary artery conduits as, as part of their concomitant um, treatment. The indication uh, for one and a half uh, ventricle includes patients with LV dysfunction secondary to the right ventricle dysfunction with an LV ejection fraction between 25 and 35 percent. It is an important thing to do uh, to perform a preoperative catheterization in these patients to obtain a um, the pulmonary arterial pressure to know if in those patients. In patients with uh, an ejection fraction less than 25, the right thing to do is to go for a heart transplantation. Other indications for BDG chance uh, are effort-induced cyanosis, inadequate right ventricle size and function, a flow in the pulmonary artery less than 0.5, uh, tricuspid regurgitation shed uh, lower than 20, an intraoperative right atrium, left atrium pressure greater than 1.5, or in the cases where we have a, a tricuspid stenosis. In our experience with cone reconstruction, we have 36 patients, 26 of them are younger than 18 years old. Uh, we have only two early deaths at our hospital, both of them uh, because uh, of low cardiac output. We have one patient that need a re-repair uh, with, with good results after the second surgery. Uh, for patients that went into the 1.5 ventricle way and eight patients with a uh, maced surgery um, associated to the cone reconstruction. So uh, now we're going to see a few works from other groups. Uh, in 2007, the Mayo Clinic presented their experience with a series of uh, 539 patients with Epstein anomaly. They have uh, 182 patients that went into tricuspid valve repair. Uh, of those, 35 went into replacement. Uh, 337 had an initial uh, valve replacement. In the results, they, there was no difference between those who had a tricuspid valve repair and a tricuspid valve uh, replacement in the survival of 12, 12 years or older. However, uh, there was a significant advantage uh, for the patient who received tricuspid valve repair in the group uh, younger than 12 years old. 
in 2006, the European Congenital Series of a multicenter study. They had 51 patients that needed replacement, 47 with tricuspid valve repair, and 36 uh, patients that went into one and a half ventricle uh, way. 12 patients uh, with palliative procedures like BT shunt, and they have uh, 20 early deaths. The highest mortality was shown in the palliative procedures. In 2015, a German group presented a series with 68 patients with Epstein's anomaly that underwent two different types of repair of tricuspid valve with early mortality of 2.9 and late mortality of 5.8. Uh, they show an improvement in the contractility of the right and the left uh, ventricle compared with the preoperative. There was also a significant improvement in the functional class and in the regurgitation of the tricuspid valve going from a preoperative uh, of 3.2 to a postoperative of 1.1. And there was also an improvement in the tolerance of exercise. The overall survival rate was about 97 at 30 days and 91 at 20 years. Freedom from reoperation was 100% at 30 days, 98 at five years, and 92 at 20 years. So as conclusion, uh, Epstein's anomaly is a spectrum of tricuspid valve and right ventricle dysplasia. The extent and severity of the disease is related to the age of presentation. Mild forms may be asymptomatic through their lives, but patients with severe forms may die within the uterus. The repair or plastic of the tricuspid valve with cone technique can be performed with low mortality and with good durability. The cone techniques rest restores the functional volume of the right ventricle, producing a remodeling of the right ventricle. The learning curve for Epstein's anomaly repairs is steep. Reproducible results are more predictable in centers with large experience. It is not controversial that valve repair is preferred, particularly in children and in young adults. Thank you so much for your attention. Great presentation, so congrats. And now uh, if Dr. David Barron want to say something we, we have yeah. in the audience, Dr. Da Silva. It is a Dr. Silva is here too, that's fantastic. Um, but no, Maria, thank you. That was really a, fan, a really excellent presentation and a really good summary of not only the, some of the data out there, but also you know some of the challenges that face, face us with uh, managing patients with Epstein. So that was really excellent. And I say we're very lucky. I think uh, Dr. Da Silva has also joined us. So we'll ask him uh, to comment in a minute. I think and the difficult thing about talking about Epstein is it's mm. such a, a complex disease. And uh, you know, your first comment saying that this is a disease of the right ventricle, it's not just a disease of the tricuspid valve. But the problem is the, this huge range of presentation. And you know, it's, it's, we, I think really today we're focusing much more on the uh, adults and the uh, adolescent cases. So the, the neonatal management, when you know, many of the patients really don't have any functional right ventricle uh, is a very different and uh, equally kind of complex challenging situation but we're really talking about the older patients where by definition they've got an adequate right ventricle they've got enough right ventricle to support uh, biventricular circulation but the problem is as you say a lot of people are relatively symptomless with uh, uh, the kind of these kind of lesser degrees of Epstein's disease. And the problem is the right ventricle is suffering and struggling with a severe regurgitation. And we still don't know the best time to, to intervene. And I'm sure all of us are faced with these older adult patients who uh, are really getting towards end stage right ventricular failure. And it's kind of too late almost to intervene. So we're constantly pushing the cardiologists to refer these patients earlier 
uh, in order to get better outcomes. And knowing that sweet spot of when the right time to operate is often the most difficult thing. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear, uh, particularly uh, Dr. De Silva's feelings on the kind of what's the best age to operate on these patients and what's the best way to assess some of these older patients in terms of the right thing to do. Because the, the cone is a beautiful operation. As Maria says, it, it certainly needs a learning curve because it's very different to any other sort of valve repair that we do. So you really need to have seen a few of these to understand uh, the anatomy. But I think you know, it's a real step change in the way we can uh, offer repairs for the Epstein valves because none of the previous repairs really recognized, I think, the true, the true you know, morphology and this failure of delamination and the importance of re-establishing you know, a full uh, 360 degrees of valve tissue up at the tricuspid annulus. So the cone has been a real improvement, but it takes a long time to do. It's quite a complex operation. And if you're faced particularly with an older adult who's got really, you know, a very often a sick and dilated right ventricle, uh, it, we have to decide whether the cone is still the right thing to do. And I think, um, you know, it's very interesting looking at the Mayo data. The Mayo data is a very helpful resource because they've got this huge experience with adult Epstein. And I think one of the messages from their kind of experience is that... Recording again, I'm very sorry. Hi, everyone. Sorry, we, we lost uh, our contact then. But sorry, I'll just pick up where I, I left off. We were just talking about the Mayo experience. And I think it is still important to recognise that when you're faced with a really, you know, quite sick adult who's really got a, a, a sick right ventricle, dilated right ventricle, sometimes going straight to a tricuspid valve replacement uh, can be the right thing to do because these, these really sick ventricles don't always tolerate a long cross clamp time. And the Mayo uh, results suggest that when the ejection fraction is dropping below 40%, then maybe just going straight to a tricuspid valve replacement in some patients may be uh, the wisest thing to do than trying to attempt a cone in some of these older patients. So I want to stop. And uh, has, Do has Dr. De Silva managed to join us again? I'm sure he'd like to comment. Hi, this is. Do you want me to make a comment? Um, sorry, because I was out of. I lost the connection here for some reason. So. Yes, I I, uh, I agree with you. What I have done, though, I, I I don't go for replacement, but I recognize that in some cases would be good to go, and 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 what I have found is that when you have a good, uh, um, uh, first. Uh, Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to join to our meeting here. I got a little confused, but my, my, my meeting went off. Uh, I think everybody did that. And, but I enjoyed the presentation and enjoying your comments. And uh, what, what uh, I have my thinking about, about that uh, now about that is that when you have um, an older patient, but has uh, the ventricle, the right ventricle that is, is in good condition, with a good structure. Normally, this is associated with a disease that's not so severe. And then in those cases, you can uh, do the cone procedure, do repair procedure that they, they do well. But they agree that some patients that are, are older, the bad ventricle, doesn't matter much what you do, they won't do so well. And they have right risk, so you should avoid to have having those patients, but sometimes does not depend on us. Uh, and in those cases, I think it doesn't make really a difference if you replace the valve or maybe especially if you're not so used to the cone or to do a, a good repair, you, if you replace the valve, probably the result will be the same. Uh, as I uh, was presented, that statistics for the Mayo Clinic, the patient older than 12, the, the result of the valve is good up to 15 years then we'll have 85% uh, free of reoperation, re replacement. But if you follow a little more, then uh, eventually all those patients are gonna need the uh, valve uh, replacement at some time. So we have to take that in consideration because I have operated like patients that are 48 years old, 
but the the, um, the last one I did was she was very big, over 100 kilos, and she had a little bit of stenosis of the pulmonary valve, and that for that reason she became very symptomatic. She had a 50 gradient in in the contest of a significant um, tricuspid regurgitation. So, uh, well, in that case, I expect a good result. It was a good result. It did some was some work in the postoperative period. Uh, so I'll say that if you have a good now, I try to differentiate for an indication. Patient has a good structure for the right vent, meaning that, like type one and two of Carpentier, the the in classification, the one that has a good mobility of the anterior. Leaflet, usually they have a good structure for the right vent. Uh, so when you, you repair, the vent tends to, to improve, tends to do well. Uh, and it's not so dangerous uh, to do a repair, even so it take a little longer to do. But, uh, but I would agree, if the patient has a bad vent too, a bad structure like type three, type uh, C and D in carpentatic, uh, situation then might be better to do a, a replace even though in my experience I, uh, I have done one case by option it was a Jehovah witness and uh, my wife did it she did it quickly a valve replacement and the patient still gave a lot of problem uh, and there was opportunity care and but she did well at the end and that's an option I agree I would, I would agree with that and, and Dr. Silva, do you think what if you had a free choice, what do you think is the ideal age that we should be offering the cone to these patients? Because many of them don't have much symptoms. Uh, as right. Isn't sometimes. Yes, I think it's very important to do earlier. Again, if, if you have a, a, bad, a bad type of Epstein, like the, if you have one... Uh, with a very displaced valve, the one that the anterior leaf at the inferior is very tethered uh, to the wall, and then you don't have um, what we call linear attachment. Those cases, sometimes the heart doesn't grow much, uh, but the patient starts uh, having uh, symptoms a little later, and sometimes they dilate the outflow drive. Uh, and then when, when you have this, it's, it's, a sign, it's a bad sign, in my opinion. Sometimes they get uh, pulmonary regurgitation. So especially in those cases that are, uh, present this type of anatomy, I think we should do the, the operation. Is everybody hearing me? Yeah. We, we should do the operation early between like three and five years of age. If they are cyanotic, then you have to do it even earlier. Uh, I think cyanosis is another component uh, for early indication because they deteriorate the heart. And the other advantage of doing earlier, if the repair is not so great, the, it's still, as the patient grows, it tends to improve. Sometimes we have a very muscular tricuspid valve, and as the patient grow, uh, the, uh, grows, the, it is, it's improved over time. And if you do it later, then you don't take advantage of that, uh, that type of thing. Also the ventricle. If the ventricle has some impairment and you do it earlier, <coughs> the patient grows some more new muscle, I think new myocardial is formed, and the patient tend to do better if they are younger. If the, this is my own experience, but I, I kind of agree that we need to, to write more paper, maybe to get together and, uh, and, uh, and resolve that situation with our own experience and uh, translate that in number, in, in statistics that could prove those points. So I, I say it as more as a philosophical uh, expression, say, and, and based on, uh, upon my experience, my own experience. Well, thank you. So, uh, I, I, can I ask you, take the opportunity to ask you some more, some technical questions, particularly about the cone in the slightly older age group. Um, is there a role for leaving an ASD uh, when you do the cone in some patients, you think? Yes, I, I, 
I always um, afraid of uh, some dysfunction in the postoperative, early postoperative uh, care. So uh, as I know I'm different than the Mayo Clinic on that, but I, I tend to do a single stitch uh, closure of the SD, uh, take the primal septum to be behind the rest of the septum and, and recover and develop mechanisms for the foramial valve. And, uh, and to do that, uh, and then what usually happens in some patients, a few patients, you have some shunting uh, postoperatively if the RV does not work so well. And the, and the O2 saturation sometimes uh, was low before, like 75, 85, and then it goes 10 points uh, above it. But normal, uh, and then uh, as the RV recovers, and it become uh, improved the auto saturation. So this has been my, my policy. In, in general, I, I, I live uh, ISD, which is a modified uh, the foramen valve uh, type. So I reduce the partial closure of the ISD and the valved one. So most of the patient in the later follow-up doesn't have ASD anymore. Uh, because you know it's like like the newborn they 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 close uh, they are recovered and the depression the left atrium uh, become greater than depression the right atrium so this has been my policy well, thank you and also um is there any role dr da silva i am da silva, da silva. i have another question to you and dr david baron uh, when you perform the con technique you uh, and you have a good motion of the anterior leaflet, uh, and when you attach the leaflet to the annulus, uh, the, the applicator that you perform, how is the, the, the size that you uh, limit your, your applicator? Because uh, perhaps one of the, of the tips of your technique is, is very important to how you reduce the, the, the true annulus of the, of the cone. Can you say something about that? Uh, Dr. De Silva, I mean, I, I usually uh, look to try and restore, um, you know, a tricuspid annulus to what is the predicted normal size for that patient based on their you know, uh, body surface area. So in an adult, you know, you're know, looking off the kind of 33, even 35 sort of annulus, because the annulus can be huge, but you're also slightly influenced by the amount of valve tissue that you have available. Right? And if you've got a really nice, generous cone with plenty of tissue, then uh, you don't have to perhaps be so uh, extreme in, in narrowing the annulus down, but you have to bring it down somewhere towards but I think you know you would be a normal predicted size for the annulus. It can be huge uh, in adult patients. Um, Dr. De Silva, what do you what do you have a a, a kind of guidance? Yes, I I will say I'll follow more or less the same thing. And and I uh, in, in especially in children, I, I I can reduce a little less than the normal uh, if I have to adapt to the size of the quantity of uh, tissues. Uh, but if I have to reduce too much, and especially when you don't have too, mu uh, too much tissues, and, uh, and it's interesting that that happens when you, you have a, a form of Epstein that is not so serious, so you don't have excess of tissues. When you have type uh, uh, three and four carpentier, especially three, you have a lot of tissues. But, but when you have uh, type uh, one, for uh, type A of Carpentier, uh, you don't have uh, too much tissues. In that scenario, when I have to, uh, I don't decrease the annulus too much, decrease to the normal size, and then I add a, a piece of autologous pericardium. If it is a young patient, normally I do fresh pericardium, I do it redundant and do fresh. But what is different from my technique with the, the Rani is that I, I, I don't add to the anterior, but the anterior is usually a big and re redundant some patients or normal in those type of patients. 
So I prefer to do it in the septal area. So, uh, so I, 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 I increase the size of the septal. I, 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 I augment the septal leaflet instead of the anterior with a big piece of pericardium. If it's older, then I put a, a number, uh, I treat it, it grows out of the height. And if like, like 15 years and older, then I tend to, to treat it to grow out of the height. And, and this, I have to restudy those. I, I do in about, um, in, in small patient, maybe 20%. And, and big patient in about maybe 10% or less. Uh, but that would be an option not to, to reduce too much the annuals. But so I would reduce a little um, more than a normal maybe and, and minus one, a Z-score minus one or minus two even, in, especially in small patient in, that has to grow when I have to adapt to the size of uh, the proximal circumference of the, co the comb. So is that answered? Jose Pedro, <laughs> do you like to put the ring associated with the repair in our patient? Yes, I, I, I haven't. I don't think it is. I think the reason I haven't done that is because the, the mechanism of the, the uh, of the closure, it will be deeper when you do the comb. So reducing the annuals does not matter that much. But when I reduce, I reduce with suture, just put some more sutures and, and tight. Uh, well, what I think is important is to have a, a very well done suture at the annuals. Because uh, I had the impression before that the pressure was low, so you put a few sutures, it'll be okay. It's not the case. So at the beginning of my experience, I had uh, some dehiscence. So especially in adults, if, if you think there is very, very weak annuals, for that reason, you want to reinforce and you want to use some material or even a re, I think it's good. I, I think it's good to reinforce. But uh, my experience, I don't use re. Okay. And then can I ask you about the, the septal leaflet is quite variable in how um, you know, well developed it is. It's always very deviated, um, but it always it usually comes back up to the level of the true annulus at the antero septal commissure. Now, are there cases where you think the septal leaflet is so small and redundant that it's not usable? And in that case, what do you do about the anterior septal commissure? Well, well, I always take down the anterior leaf that uh, attachment to the, to, the, to the septum or that region near the septum, because that will, will, do, will make you do a true comb because some blood is gonna go behind it. It will pass behind it and, and help in the closing mechanism. I know that some people, I saw the drawing there from, from the running. I think I participated in that paper. I don't ever comment that detail of the drawing that they don't work in the, we think the, the, the anthroceptal commissure is normal. You don't touch it. I normally do it. I normally touch it and make it a little more, a little deeper. Um, so I, I think that, and there are cases that you don't have septal leaflet at all, but those are very uncommon. You always have some piece of uh, tissue there that you, you can use. And, um, and normally I rotate the, the inferior and, 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 um, and combine with that piece. So that will be just the, 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 the subvolver apparatus, the sustentation for for uh, for the septal leaflet, for, I mean for the, the inferior leaflet that I rotate. In those cases, I rotate, but normally we don't. I don't rotate it too much. It's just you know, uh, I just do something, uh, do like a diagonal suture, so the inferior combine with the septal, because normally the septal leaflet in Abyssinia normally is a little wider near the the art. Uh, 
a nearly anthroceptal uh, commissure, and then it goes deeper as go inferiorly. And so I, I do like, I, I rotate a little bit of the inferior and do a suture like, uh, that's also oblique uh, suture at that region. So this will be some details of the septal, the pulmonary obstruction of the septal area. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I haven't got too much time left, but can we talk a little bit about sort of assessment of the patients? We've talked a lot about kind of echo, um, but particularly in uh, patients who maybe don't have, again, that, that much in the way of symptoms. And so the decision for uh, timing of interventions is more difficult. Do you think um, uh, MRI is important in terms of preoperative assessment? Uh, 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 my opinion on that, yes, I, I, I think so. With MRI, you can uh, have a better measurement of the volume, so you, you don't miss that the patient is getting enlarged to the right ventricle. And, and I think it's also very important uh, for comparison later on. There are many papers now that are coming uh, describing the the what happens to the RV after the con procedure. And I think this will be an important tool to, to define what happened and also uh, to help in the indication. So big institution like yours and, and the one I work through, we, I think we have to study those cases in, to define the indication and then to define the prognosis and help uh, with numbers uh, to propose uh, with more you know, science, let's say, uh, the best timing uh, for, to do the con or other repair. Yeah, and, all, and also I was thinking, do you think it's important that all patients should have an EP study uh, prior to their surgery? Yeah, not all. No, here we do in, in many of them, but not in all patients, if they don't have a history or anything like that, a suspicion by the, the normal EKG or holder, we don't do it. But any suspicion we do. But what I do at the operation, though, is that uh, in all patients now, I do some ablation. So I go in, 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 in the annulus and ablate the anterior until near the coronary sinus. And then I, I, I complete my incision to, to the um, to the tricusp annulus, uh, and then, and normally I do uh, I do another line of ablation with RF ablation, a little probe from Meditronic, and I go from the annulus to the to the cava, the cava. Uh, uh, and uh, the cava tricus uh, istimus ablation. And I think with this, I have very few uh, case of uh, atrial fibrillation uh, by doing that, by completing that incision to the, the annulus. And of course, if you have the diagnosis of uh, WPW, then you have to go after the, the abnormal conduction tissues. Uh, but if I don't have a study, normally I tend to, to do something in that area. Now that we have the resource, I tend to ablate the, the annulus and, and then that area that I just described. Well, thank you. So we're, we're kind of running out of time. Does anyone have any other particular questions they wanted to raise? Jose Pedro, can you make a some comment for patient with a um, high risk uh, high risk patient for heart transplantation? For heart transplantation, yes. Well, it's interesting that uh, I had a girl that that this, that, that had a um, bad ventricle, but she was so young and she was. Uh, she came to me initially, has a mild dysfunction of the left ventricle. The left ventricle was small, compressed, and a big right ventricle. She had arrhythmias and other things, so I recommend the operation. But because she was uh, Jehovah's Witness, she didn't want to do it. 
uh, uh, the, they want to do, but we want to do without transfusion. I said, that's too risk. I, I, I didn't accept to do this myself. Uh, then, then she came six months only. This is entirely this because it's very important to understand the indication and sometimes it gets very urgent to indicate. And then she came with a much more dysfunctional RV uh, and LV as well. And she was hypotensive. And the family was so afraid that they said, no, you can do whatever you want. If you need transfusion, fine. Uh, we'll forget the religion for some time now. And then I did the operation, but I should not do. I, I was uh, afraid to do and, and it was not a good indication. So I did the operation, the common procedure. Then the middle of the night, I had to put her on ECMO. And then I did, uh, I didn't get a good heart transplant. That, that would be an indication at that point. And, and I got a, a, limit, a limited heart, so a borderline type of heart. So it was much smaller than her. Then I did a, a heterotop heart transplant. And this was six years ago. And now she's playing tennis, but she has two hearts. She has a head to the top. Because in Brazil, we didn't have a machine for long term. And it would be difficult to support that kind of patient too in the long term with two, two pumps. She would require two, two pumps. So I would say if you have dysfunction, moderate dysfunction, or, or if you have like a non-compacted, uh, non-compaction uh, left ventricle, and then I think we better you better go to transplant. Uh, I had another case that was 72 years old and she came to me, but she had a, a dysfunction. Uh, she was from Mexico, she didn't come to me. She sent the, the data, the medical data, and she had a bad dysfunction of the left ventricle. She was at, at one time, she was hypertensive, but uh, the, the right vent was not that bad. Uh, but she had a uh, heart block and she, pay, uh, she used a pacemaker for five, five years. So what I recommend her is to resynchronize the heart. If that works, then we might consider to, uh, in that case, to replace the tricuspid block, I would say. Uh, so uh, in her case, it was not indication for transplant because she was too old. Uh, so I said, we uh, asked the, um, the EP guys to, to study her to see if it was possible uh, to do a resynchronization. Suspect that was because of a lack of uh, resynchronization uh, in, uh, in the left ventricle, induced by the pacemaker placed uh, in the endocardium of the right ventricle. Did I answer? Go to transplant usually. Dr. Da Silva, what, what do you think about uh, the RV remodeling when after the cone technique? Uh, the, you see uh, in how much time you see something or, or you yeah. never see? Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. To, so that's complete more or less what I said before. When you have those patients that will have to take down the anterior leaflet and the inferior leaflet, then you take down to the near the apex. And then it becomes mostly a membrane because of the type of abscess. Uh, and then you do the cone, but that anterior wall tends to, uh, to balloon. So now I am uh, doing, I think I put a movie because I'm gonna do a presentation for you and some techniques, right? Is that correct or no? Do we have time for that? Well, Patty, yes. what do you say? We, we're supposed to wound up by now. How are we doing for time? Yes, so, sure, sure. Right. Please go ahead. If you want to discuss, please go ahead. Right, right. So I, I have prepared the presentation. If you want, I can I can show you. But what happens is that uh, in, in, in that situation, there's a tendency for ballooning, and especially when you do a little later the operation, uh, those patients uh, don't recover. If they recover, they don't recover completely. So what I have done uh, last maybe 10 years, I have to publish that, <laughs> but I have to, to get some data before, 
is, is to connect those papillary muscles that I, I, I take from the leaflet and then I put them together and I try to reestablish that angle between the, the inferior wall and the anterior wall near the diaphragm. I have that acute angle, some authors say that, but um, so I, I try to give a better shape for the ventricle with more um, structure inside the right ventricle. Um, I have the impression that that improved. And the other thing is to operate early on, because if you do later, uh, those are the, the cases that don't evolve well. I think that's the key, and that's one of the most important messages, I think, is, is for us as surgeons to persuade our cardiologists to uh, refer these patients earlier and not to right. fix them year after year after year in their clinics. Um, it, especially those cases that I, I try to divide now Pay attention to that. If you don't have uh, an excellent papillary muscle, you don't have good mobility of the anterior. In the echo, you don't see the, the blood going uh, to the ventricle through the, the leaflet. It looks like the leaflet is closed. You see the holes is not there where it should go because it should be. Because when you have papillary muscle, you see the, the blood going through the leaflet. The distal part of the leaflet. When you don't have this, it's distal attach, uh, linear attachment. And, and that linear attachment, uh, in my impression, is it's connected. It will be like, like type three, uh, type the C of Carpentier or even D. And, and in those situations, I, I think they, they don't evolve well if you have to do earlier. I think that's the, the message that we, send, that we have to send to the cardiologists because we're going to do the comb that the only procedure that can make that valve work again, get the function for that valve. And if in, in those cases, uh, I, I think it's not, uh, uh, you have to indicate a little earlier. Another thing that I would say is that if the heart is already dilated, you in, in the patient sand hot for a, a little long, a long time, like seven years old, with seven years of cyanosis, then might I am considering now to do instead of doing the comb directly to do like the a little modified of the modification of the stern procedure because with that the ventricle will will reduce the size before you do the operation and and in this hypothesis might might work because in some patients like ten years old or twelve years old when you do the associate that with the gland, instead of doing a shunt, do a gland, and then wait for the heart to get smaller, and then do the cone technique. That, that, that could be an option, that is just a hypothesis, of course, but uh, maybe we should consider after studying what happened to those patients. Um, uh, I had a patient who was only four years old, but she had already dilated alpha tract, and that and pulmonary regurgitation, which I address when I do the operation too, I reduce the, the end of the pulmonary artery at the commissure, the pulmonary valve. And by doing that, I, uh, I get the valve to work again, the pulmonary valve. And, and then with those maneuvers, might have some improvement and the, and the reverse remodel of the right venture. But they still don't know for sure. We're gonna study that very soon. Thank you. I, so, Dr. So did you say you had a presentation you wanted to show? Yeah, but I have a presentation here to show a few um, movies. And uh, I'm glad to see for the group if they want, I can. I am trying to do a library, a video library. Uh, so, Matthew, can we do that? We can do that. The only problem that we have is that I don't know why today the Zoom meeting is closing every 40 minutes somehow. I don't know what happened with the account. So it's going to close the meeting in five minutes. So, okay. like, of course, if you want to stay there, I can reopen it again. We, we, uh, yeah. Or you can I also have share. My ready to go. I can show yes, yes. 30 minutes yes. if you want. Yes. A yeah, longer presentation. Yeah, I, 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 can, uh, I can skip some. Or that and show more the techniques if you want. 
Okay, no, please go ahead. We, we, we can't miss this opportunity. Okay, so then you, you are going to close this meeting, open another one because of 40 minutes. So we can close yes, five. sure. We can do that, of course. I can close this one and then I can reopen it again if you want to join again. So we will have 40 minutes again if you want. Yeah, let's okay. do that. I, I, I apologize. I don't know. Yeah, I apologize. Is this the, somehow the first time it happens, but it's closing every 40 minutes? Okay. No problem. Okay. You do that now, Matt. We're all joining. We're going to stop that and then we re enter. Is that correct? Correct. The same, yes, meeting, the same meeting. I just close and open again. All right. Okay. Okay. So um, I am um, interesting that I start doing this in '93. Some people say that uh, interesting that I didn't know about um, about Dr. Carpentier technique when I started. I was caught in the OR, and then I uh, I decided to, to put together the, the anterior and the inferior leaf. It was a big, big valve in the case of a girl, because I could not do this, the, the operation I used to do at the Cleveland Clinic, which was uh, uh, the dentistry technique. Uh, and that was good, because when I read his paper, he said, oh, at the end, we cover uh, the, all the annuals and 360 degree. In fact, he what he does is a is a is a different type from monocus valve, and of course he mobilized the anterior and the inferior, but he didn't pay attention to the septal, didn't cover the septal area. So uh, so it's interesting. That was good that I didn't know about this technique. And so here is I think I'm gonna cross this because I show the movies to be short because everybody knows those things here. So in some cases you don't have septum at all, like this one. And, and if you have a good anterior and inferior, you can do a nice cone based on um, the anterior and inferior. This is a very old picture, the, the beginning of my experience, but I still had I took down uh, the anterior septal um, attachment. This the septal and anterior attachment, this uh, the anterior leaflet. And if it's all, I didn't have septal leaflet. So, this one was the first case I did. Here you see the anterior leaflet uh, displaced, a uh, large lateralized. Here the coronary signs, the two trichas valve, so good displacement of the septal leaflet. So here I'm super, uh, this is more the inferior leaflet being detached from this abnormal attachment to the NRV. And here the septal leaflet was detached proximally. You see it's a very nice septal leaflet. And in this case it's separate from the anterior. And then I do this initial vertical suture uniting the septal with the anterior. So this until the septal comes short. And then I do the other vertical suture with um, unite the inferior with the anterior. See, this is a very small, uh, not so big uh, sep um, uh, atralized. So I'm um, just excluding that part. And then I placate the ends in only one part, only one site. And then I reposition the valve. So this septa was placated uh, in the proximal area. So this was a four years old girl. And the heart became perfectly competent, the valve. See, so pre-op echo was a big RV. And then a late post-operative, you see that the RV beats very well. And, and in this echo, the same girl nine years after the, the con repair. And now she's adult. And see the trichas valve works very nicely here. Good the captation of the anterior and septal leaflet and the minimal uh, trichas valve regurgitation. So what I, I, I call attention to this uh, article by Ho Sai, um, that 
that shows that the anomalous AV connection, about 50% of the patient has anomaly. It's very common to see um, in the atrioventricular junction and the anterior uh, uh, annulus, that's true annulus of the, uh, or even the, here will be the inferior actually, to see um, bundles of muscle crossing the annulus. And of course, you should see that is you have to, uh, to cauterize it, to ablate it, or you go in the epicardio as I used to do in the past and, uh, and separate uh, the agent from the ventral, doing that. And the other uh, issue is that the AV nodes is normally, uh, instead of the normal, normally is in the apex of the, the, to, the Todaro ligament and the, encounter with the annulus, the septal annulus, the, the triangle of cock. And in Abyssin is a little bit more displaced to the right, and a little closer to the coronary sinus. And this, as if, this is the technique I use uh, to ablate uh, this isthmus between the inferior cava and the annulus. Here's the coronary sinus, so I go a little bit anterior to it. And then normally, because I have the probe there, so I cauterize the true annulus. Because when you placate here, you can have arrhythmia. So this was a valve, very muscular valve. I had to put a little patch here, just, to, just as a curiosity. And I do it in the septal area. So, so talking about that too, I, for, for instance, in this case, in the lat, you have a, a patient. And so I can delineate this area to try to suture the valve here to the, the proximal attachment of the cone in this area. So I go in the base of the cone and then I, I try to follow the Todaro uh, tendon, staying away. From, from the AV node. The AV node should be around this little vein here, a little bit, instead of being here, it's a little bit more on the right side. And then, uh, all case that I can, I put the valve a little higher, uh, a little more proximal, and attach it to the, in the, this area here. So in this way, I prevent always uh, AV block, and the valve works well. Regarding the atrial, uh, atrial septal defect closure, in this case, I have the, the type of PFO, and I put a suture here in the primal septum, and then I, I pass it behind. And then when I, I tie, it becomes competent from the left to the right, and, but allows some, uh, some uh, passage of blood from the right to the left. And sometimes you can dilate it in the cat lab. So this is, is a patient with a huge uh, annulus, anterior leaflet, inferior leaflet, the septal leaflet is, is small. If you look at this for chamber view, you see that this, here the septal leaflet, and there's a little space between the septal leaflet and, and the septum. And it goes down. So in this case, I took down a uh, deeper. Uh, so here's the technique, open widely, the right edge so is the anterior leaflet, good morphology. The inferior leaflet, not so bad. And this is a septal leaflet, was small, apparently a small. I start in, in about noon, the incision, then I go, Clockwise, take all those muscles. So this is the, the posterior uh, lip, uh, papillary muscle, I take it down from the anterior wall. So here's the medial papillary muscle is, uh, is connect to the anterior leaflet. So I try to mobilize it the most I can. And this is a small septal leaflet. But when you start taking down, you see that's not so bad. And in this case, I went way down. 
So distally, you can get some of the septal bands. And then this is anastomosis of the anterior and septum, and then the anterior and inferior. Then I look for holes, proximal holes in the cone. Here is the, this is that, uh, the posterior septal, I mean, papillary muscle. This commissure between the inferior and anterior. Now I'm doing some plication. In, in kids now, I, I don't placate so much. Sometimes I do just interrupted suture there, unless you have a really important. In this case, I was a huge annual, so I, I am placating in the anterior septal. I placate here, and then I placate here near the inferior septal commissure. And then I'm replacing the valve its position. See here, I really did have some a reach of fibrous tissue. I use it to, to do the implantation. So here's the result. So that does not leak in the test. And this is uh, three years after the cone operation. See that the valve, the excellent coaptation and that muscular uh, leaflet, it, it become a little thinner. Uh, over time. I, and this is the same case. So you see like a little cone here. It's still, uh, if you leave that as kind of uh, muscular. These are not showing, but just showing that the operation is durable, the result. And then uh, to illustrate that, I show this 18 month postoperative echocardiogram with excellent palpitation, good inflow, and minimal regurgitation. And the annulus, here you see that the annulus is slightly smaller than the annulus for the mitral valve, um, but still have a good function of the valve without uh, gradient, significant gradient. This is to illustrate the Carpentier technique because uh, this is a patient who was nine years old, girl. And then when she become, uh, when she was four, she had a uh, surgery in Brazil, did the Carpentier technique. I don't know if it was well done, but the fact is that over time, the valve has become uh, progressively regurgitated. And like you see here in the right. And the reason for that is that uh, that happened in children with Carpentier technique because it is a monocusp. So the annulus can grow more than, than the valve can cover. And then, then there will be regurgitant. If you do an adult, then there's a different story. And the Carpentier might be good to, to do the, the annual plastic ring. And, and here is the same case. So in the left, you see the, the result, those are, was left a cleft here too between the anterior and inferior leaflet. Uh, but here in the middle, see, I redid, I did the cone. See that after the cone, the, and the, anterior, the septal leaflet is well covered. And this has so much leaflet that I could uh, reattach um, and add the todaro tendon here. And here's the result. So perfect result. Now everything is gonna grow together. So uh, it's a, it's, <laughs> the doctor said that the modification of the carpentine is a big modification, I'd say. And this is, uh, I studied that I did, uh, I, I, it's not published, uh, I didn't publish it, but I did uh, my, uh, after I reached about 200, near 200 patients, I compared the patient under 12. So, and the one over 12 years of uh, age. What happens that the patient under 12, this include uh, hospital mortality, they're all alive, except for one girl who died of non-cardiac um, uh, problems. She had a, a, an accident and she died in a swimming pool at uh, three years of age, unfortunately. Except for that, no one died. And this is, has been my experience my whole life. Now I have over, over 200 patients, younger than 12, and none of them died. It's very interesting. 
Now the adult, the older patient, then you have you have some patient who died, maybe for dysfunction of the right ventricle. This includes my initial experience. Now I think I'm a little better on that, the better in the indication, the results have improved, but still there is a difference. I'm always afraid to, to operate in the patient that are older with a bad structure of the right ventricle. So the challenges would be uh, to do the colon would be severe tricus valve morphological malformation, tricus valve rotated into the RVOT, and severe damage to the RV structure of, that happen over time. And also heart failure in new uh, in anomaly, newborn anomaly. So this is a case that I did here. It was 47 years old woman. She started, she, she had a very significant uh, tricus regurgitation because there was a gap between uh, the inferior and septal leaflet. And, but other than that, she had a good structure for the tricus valve after taking down and, and, and for the ventricle as well. And here you see the result. I placate in two spots here, the annulus. This is to prevent kinking on the right coronary artery. And the result is, is was very good. And this to show what I call uh, a, a good RV uh, morphology or structure. You have papillary muscle, you have a good uh, trabeculation of the ventricle. In this case, it has so much leaflet that I could uh, reattach it above the level uh, um, of the normal attachment of the track as well. So I did it in, in the Todaro, uh, Tendo Todaro. And here you see that there's no regurgitation, the function is good, and she was 47 years old. It was very symptomatic. Now there's another patient who's 19 years old, and, but he had a lot cyanotic since he was born, he was born. And here you see the anterior leaflet is reasonable. It's not displaced, the sept, but the inferior is displaced, and the septum is small. And though, so I do by taking down the anterior, the inferior, and then I always make that incision, the anterior septal area, to take down the, the anterior uh, from the sept, uh, from this area, and also to, to approach the the abnormal attachment near the pulmonary artery in case of rotation. And here you can see that the anterior is, was left connected to the, the septal leaflet. And here I rotated the, the inferior to combine with the septal leaflet. And, and then the result was, was very good. So, but the myocardial, didn't work so well. So here you see, this is a patient from the beginning of my experience. And uh, it's part of that publication that they did with the Rani. And, um, and the operative technique. And you see that this is excellent population, excellent function for the, the valve. This is about one year after the operation. But the ventricle has not improved, even though it had a, a regular, uh, a good structure, the anterior leaf at mobile, but she was cyanotic for a long time. This is a patient, is a specimen from the Heart Museum of the Children's Hospital. And, and this is a type of uh, anatomy where you have a displacement of the septal leaflet. And the anterior and the inferior leaf are, are very like plastered to the wall of the, of the right ventricle. So this area here does not dilate very much. But then here you see the opening toward the outflow tract. And here you see the valve in the outflow tract. So the outflow tract is enormous, very dilated. Here's the pulmonary uh, valve. And, and this patient died when he was 14 years old. So the cardiologist from here, Zuber, Dr. Zuber, a long name, it, uh, uh, we call him Zuber, 
and he was a famous cardiologist from him, and he had hypothesized, he wrote a paper showing that those patients had a bad, bad prognosis. And I would uh, say that they don't dilate the heart very much. So this is uh, five years old that I operate in Brazil, the Dante Pazanaz Institute by invitation. And here you can see that it's a good mobility for the anterior um, leaflet. But when you put color, you don't see the, the color go inside there, very little here. So this we, we diagnose that linear attachment is the inferior leaflet, is very small. And here in the right, you see the short axis that the valve is, uh, is, uh, is um, rotated toward the pulmonar valve. So it's opening there. And not you know that, that then the outflow tract is dilated and the, and the contractility is poor. So this is a case of five years old girl with uh, already a bad prognosis has to be operated. Here's the x-ray, you see that the, the outflow tract of the right ventricle is dilated. And here you see uh, the anterior leaflet, attachment to the anterior wall. And, uh, and here you see that the, the valve is opening toward the outflow tract. So this is a movie that my wife did. Uh, so the anterior with the cell phone. So this is the anterior papillary muscle only a little hole there, and this is the inferior papillar, um, leaflet, not papillar muscle, leaflet. And I, the goal is to put the valve open in that direction. So we, we take down the anterior and the inferior leaflet. We try to make it uh, very separate from the other muscles. So we, we take just the membrane, it will be a membranous valve type. So we go deep in that, we look inside and outside and take down until we get to the very distal. So this ventricle tend to bulge, you know, to, to balloon the right ventricle after that maneuver. So this is the anteroceptor commissure. So I'm taking down the valve and cutting those attachments that are near the outflow tract. And this is the septal leaflet. It's very rudimentary. rudimentary. And so I'm gonna use it only uh, to, to support part of the anterior leaflet. See here is. In case like this, sometimes I, I mount the valve, I mount the cone uh, if, for making the real cone, the actual cone. So I have a bad idea. So this is important uh, suture to close those holes. I do like transverse closure to the decrease the, the chance of, of stenosis. Here, we, uh, that maneuver that I told you, that I tried to, to take the popular, abnormal papillary muscle and reattach to the wall to avoid that ballooning of the valve. So all those muscles that are left there, I don't leave them flopping around, I, I connected something else. And here's the atrialized part. I didn't do the conventional vacation. And even the outflow tract, I tried to, to give some support to that area. And now finally, I come back to, to do the cone, reattach, and then it is a good result, good functional result. Here's the echo, also intraoperative. So you see that there is uh, a little prolapse of the leaflet, but that doesn't matter because the coaptation is deeper. So you see here, there's a good inflow in minimal regurgitation. And the ventricle, I see you see the ventricle that I reconstruct in that fashion. It's not ballooning too much, even though there is some dysfunction in some areas that ventricle. Like you, you see here, 15 days post-operative, you see some dysfunction of the right ventricle, even though the, the patient's five years old, but the result is still very good. 
And uh, another sign that is important is this paradoxical movement of the septic that's still there. But this, this girl uh, has no symptoms anymore. She was very symptomatic and, and she tends to improve the vent over time. This uh, I just touch in, uh, in the case of a newborn. There's this paper here that was published in the, in the circulation uh, in 2015, involving 240 fetus that were diagnosed with the ABC anomaly. It's interesting that the, the main author here works uh, at Toronto now, Dr. Freud. Uh, I think that's the way you pronounce her name. But what happens is that 48% of those patients died, didn't leave the hospital. And so, and, and the most important, uh, uh, predicted uh, factors of mortality was pulmonary atresia and uh, pulmonary regurgitation with circular shunt physiology. So it was a situation that involved uh, very important hospital in the American and other countries too, and, and the results were not so good. So it was a challenge to the surgeons. And I think this operation here, the Steins operation, can decrease the mortality. So if you do a Stein operation, normally one or two days after the patient is born, sometime immediately, you, you can save many patients. And, and so we exclude the right ventricle. With this, we decompress also the left uh, ventricle and that's that septal motion change around. And what I have done lately is uh, in, here in Pittsburgh that all, almost all the patients here I want to do uh, the cone operation after they start because I noticed that uh, in a study that um, the ventricle start big, then he become a good size and then finally become very small. So at some point, it's possible to recover that band uh, and bring it to, to the circulation again. And in this case, I, I, I did the, the cone, as you see here in the right. Uh, I, I, I have used a little piece of Ricard in the septal area. And then the, the pulmonary valve was a presia, and, and the second one was done the gland. And they, Dr. Morel did the valvotomy because the vent was small, so he, he got some forward uh, flow there and good saturation for that girl. And then she became 17 months old. I repaired the, the trachus valve and also repaired the pulmonary valve. I kind of developed the leaflet and put a patch to complete the anterior leaflet. And, and the valve has a uh, uh, regular good function. I, I might have that, that slide there. And here is a case of uh, severe pulmonary regurgitation. That is a, a very good demonstration of circular shunt. So the, the, the blood recirculation inside the heart and that result uh, in bad perfusion of, the, of tissues and normally the, the fetal demise or, or fetal damage because of this type of circulation with the low cardiac output for the fetal. Doctor, so, just yeah. one second. The Zoom is uh, telling me again that we have the last nine minutes. So maybe you can start running up if you would like. Okay, all right, right. So this uh, Dr. Lillian Lopes treated these fetus like they do in Toronto too. I think Dr. Barron can tell that. And, and the, then the, 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 the ducts became much smaller and the patient survived to 34 weeks. And then my colleague in, in Brazil did um, a stern procedure because the pulmonary artery was small, he, he put in the main trunk and he did a nice maneuver. Instead of ligating the pulmonary artery, he put a patch inside it, the main trunk. So it was easier to recover the pulmonary artery later on. Here you see the control, it's a small RV and the pulmonary artery here with the valve is still there. And, uh, and I'll, I'll show this operation quickly. Uh, I went there and did the operation. So here you see the shunt from the axiophatic artery to the main trunk. We are opening the, the RV. Here's the 
stand fetch which I have to open commonly not to make lesion in the conduction system or the valve. So he is near the coronary sinus. So we live in this, especially this area, we live a little bit of fibrous tissue, so we can reattach the valve to the fibrous tissue, preventing heart loss. So we are putting out, the, removing the, completely removing that. And then we put that suture to uh, expose a little better than to lift that uh, hinging line here. See, it's very displaced. This valve was rotated to the alpha drive. So I'm removing and taking down the anterior leaflet. This is some fibrous tissues that was attached to the valve because of the, the patch. We had to put the patch a little above the end to prevent that. Now this is the inferior leaflet, very muscular. So it has to shave it off from the, the right ventricle. Then normally we put some stay suture and then always go to the anteroceptal attachment. Start in the annulus, then go down toward the septal leaflet. So in this case, I thought it was very hard to do that in keeping the valve attachment in a part of the valve. So here we are completing the detachment. So in about 10% of the case, we do that. We go all the way around detaching the, the tricuspid valve from the annulus like we did here. Someone published that before us, but we do this a long time too. So this is the septal leaflet. It's very thin, very good quality septal leaflet. But the problem with this valve is very, very rotated. It made that technically difficult because of that. And this patient was five months old when we did the operation. So this is a, the anterior and septal leaflet. It was a linear attachment. So I took it down and make some uh, fenestration here in the distal part of it. It's so small, it's hard to see, even though the movie was reasonably all good. So now I'm reattaching the valve. So I don't have to placate much the septum. Here I did a minimal placation near the coronary sinus. So here's the coronary sinus. And then I reattach the valve with, uh, I think in this case, I didn't use any patch, no patch, no pericardial patch. So I use those fibrous tissues to do the reattachment. A little bit of testing here. And then so so here I do it interrupt the suture, but then I run with a PDS suture, especially in this uh, area here between the and, and the valve was reasonable, was competent, fill up the heart. And then um, I went to do the, the pulmonary valve. So I'm removing that patch that uh, my colleague, Dr. Rodrigo Fez, placed there. And then a little bit of superviral volaris stenosis. I work on that. Improve the mobility of the pulmonary valve and also the commissure. So this is the pulmonar valve. Then of course I had to put a patch here and complete the work. And also I do, um, I close 
the, the atrial septum defect was a huge septal defect with a fenestrated patch. So I don't depend on, a, on the ventricle. But see, the ventricle beats very nicely after this starts. And, uh, and she was a little cyanotic because of the penetration, but nowadays she's, uh, she's normal uh, baby and doing very well. I just want to finalize, uh, finalize showing this. This is the pre-op newborn. Uh, here you don't show much, but he had uh, the septum leaflet was uh, doing a paradoxal movement in diastole. And then after the, the starting procedure, you have a much better feeling of the right ventricles in diastole. And here after the cone, you see the tricus valve and you see the, the pulmonary valve. But this is the case that I did in Pittsburgh, not that case that I just showed the movie. So I think here I did, uh, now I had almost 50 Ks, 48 Ks, and I have two more to go. And I had eight newborn, and so far uh, I didn't lose a patient, so I'm very happy with the results. I think I, I finalized here because I want to show just those technical aspects, and I don't want to take more time of you, <laughs> okay? So if someone wants to ask a question, it'll be okay. Maybe, maybe Dr. Barrow can close the meeting. We still have one minute, and then the Zoom is going to close. <coughs> Yeah, okay, we should close quickly then. Pedro, thank you so much. That's a fantastic uh, experience and a real treat for us to see a real masterclass. So thanks so much to everyone who stayed on to see that little extra, uh, all that extra information from Dr. De Silva. So a whole lot to learn and I think to learn. I think real, uh, a lot of this information that is uh, available now, you can see it, you can stream it online. So go and see some of the operative videos, but look up Dr. De Silva's papers and the Mayo Clinic papers, because I think they give us a whole lot of insight into managing Epstein's, particularly in the older patients. So thank you, everybody. That's been a really, uh, really uh, exceptional uh, bit of, bit of uh, uh, insight into managing the Epstein's and managing the cone. Uh, thank you, Matteo, for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. De Silva, for joining us and providing all those wonderful videos. So thank you, everybody, and uh, hopefully uh, you can carry on with these really excellent educational meetings. Thanks, Matteo. Thank you so much. Thank you all for thank me. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.